beginning at verse number 23, Matthew 4 and verse number 23, the Bible says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, which means there is a difference between a sickness and a disease. Probably won't get to that till next week. Y'all have to come back and get that one. Uh, but he was healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him, watch this, all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed. Y'all notice how Matthew's getting ready to get real specific on us here? They're not just any old kind of sick folk. These are sick folk that got demons. Amen, walls. They're epileptics and they're paralytics. And the Bible says Jesus healed. And because he healed them, great multitudes followed him from Galilee. And from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. <sighs> Decided now, we got two more weeks left for hospitality. Uh, we're talking about welcoming and all that. So I got to split this last sermon up into two parts. I'm going to give you part one this morning. And I want to speak to you from the subject, are you here to see the doctor? <laughs> now... Those of you who grew up in the 80s like I did, I got ready to call this go see the doctor, but I didn't want y'all to think I was talking about venereal diseases. <laughs> y'all who grew up on Kumo D know what I'm talking about. The words hospitable, hospital, and hospice are all connected to the same root word. The definition begins with the understanding that someone in need is to be helped. Over time, three distinct words influence both how help is to be offered and where help is to be offered. The word hospitable is both a verb and an adjective that means receiving or treating guests or strangers warmly and generously characterized by or promising warmth and generosity towards guests or strangers in a favorable, open, and receptive way. According to the scripture, hospitality is love and care for the stranger. As Christians, we are called to be hospitable to one another. We are called to entertain strangers we are admonished to have an attitude of hospitality. Our elders are supposed to practice hospitality. My friends, the church is a group of people that not only welcomes the stranger, but actively seeks to meet the needs of those who need Jesus. Paul would say that we should be given to hospitality. Peter would admonish us to practice hospitality. According to dictionary.com, a hospice is a health care facility for the terminally ill that emphasizes pain control and emotional support for the patient and family, typically refraining from taking extraordinary measures to prolong life. Those under hospice care are not looking to live. They are waiting to die. Hospice patients don't take medicine to correct or cure their problem. Neither do they take preventative measures to prolong life. In hospice, 
The transition to death is inevitable and anticipated. Hospice care is driven by comfortability, ease, and accommodation. My friends, the church is not a hospice care facility. We are not gathered here waiting for death to come get us. We do not assemble ourselves in an effort to make ourselves comfortable. We are not looking for death. For the children of God, Jesus defeated death. The last great enemy of ours has been defeated, and we are here to celebrate the life we now have in Christ. A hospital is an institution that provides medical, surgical, or psychiatric care and treatment for the sick or injured. There are people in our midst right now who are sick, and don't know it. I wish I had somebody knew what I was talking about. You don't even realize you might have cancer right now. You don't know because you ain't shown no symptoms. Sick as all get out, but don't know it. Just because you don't have symptoms don't mean you ain't sick. Amen, somebody. There are others here who have seen the doctor and are aware of his remedies, yet refuse, amen, Walls, to follow his prescription. The doctor already told you to repent. Doctor already told you not to go there. Doctor already told you to get rid of them friends. Doctor already told you quit sleeping with him. Doctor already told you to get off the weed. Doctor already told you to get your taxes right. Doctor already told you to stop lying, yet instead Still, you refuse to take the medicine prescribed by the doctor. Wish I had somebody who was going to help me preach this morning. Still, there are those here who are willing to celebrate the healing power, the recovery, and the wellness found only in Jesus Christ. The church assembles with people who are hurting, tired, stuck, and sick. The majority of us, however, are conflicted because we are both patient and nurse. I wish I had somebody that can say amen. We come to encourage sick people to be well, yet we are sick ourselves. We too are in line to see the doctor. Maybe if we realize we too are patients, we wouldn't be impatient with the new patients. Do I need to say that again? Uh, if we realize that we too are patients, maybe we wouldn't get impatient with the new. Somebody need to tweet that, amen. Just get at me, Tyson Moore 3, amen. <laughs> We're in line to see the doctor. Since the ministry of Christ, I'm sorry, I, I got to go back. Uh, still here to see, there we go. The, since the ministry of Christ was always focused on those in need, Jesus spent most of his time with weary, life-beaten, tattered, and downtrodden people. It was to these that the Son of God brought hope, Healing, renewal, rejuvenation, a new outlook, and abundant life. The church can never be a hospice. A hospice is not for promoting life. It is simply a comfortable transition from life to death. The church does not assemble in preparation for a funeral or a home-going service. Can I just say this while we're here? We, we ain't coming here because we're sad. We coming here because we happy and excited. Amen, walls. We, we come here because we got something to shout about. We come here because we've been redeemed. We come here because God is good. We come here because God's still on the throne. We come here because he ain't gave up on us yet. 
coming to worship folk humdrum down in the lips, down in the face. Jesus didn't die for you to be down in the dumps. Jesus got up from the grave so you could be excited. Jesus didn't just ask us to assemble to have a funeral service. We come together on the first day of the week to celebrate the God of the living. Jesus said in Matthew 22 and verse 32 that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Some people believe that becoming a member of the church places you in a holding pattern, stuck on autopilot. Cruise control, cruising at a respectable altitude until death. Contrary to popular belief, maintaining is not a position in Christ. In Christ, you are either living or dying. You either growing or dying. You either moving or dying. You either climbing or dying. Fighting or dying. Trying a dying. There are no holding patterns in Christ Jesus. The mission of Jesus' Galilean ministry was evidenced by the realness of his approach, teaching and preaching, the relevance of his message, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and the redemptive quality in his work. What made his ministry redemptive, Tyson? He was a healer. Ministry becomes redemptive when it speaks life, wholeness, and restoration into people who need the Lord. Now, before I leave this slide right here, I'm going to just say this while I'm here to make sure we understand. Brother Tyson is called by God to minister to you, the group of people assembled in the name of God. But my job is not to be your cheerleader. I want you to understand, you better come in here already on fire and excited. If you waiting on me to get you there, if you waiting on Brother Barry to sing that particular song to get you there, you already too late to the party. Secondly, while I'm here and flying by, the church have to have ministry that speaks life into people and not focus on people's mess. We all know we messy. We don't need no reminders of the mess. We need help to get us out. Second thing, we got to be honest with ourselves. Don't act like we know the way out when we ain't out of it ourselves. That means everybody can't do every ministry. Amen, Tyson. Everybody ain't the one that need to go visit. Everybody ain't the one that need to preach. Everybody ain't the one that need to say. Everybody can't do everything. There's some ministry you got to keep your hands off of until you have victory. I wish I had somebody knew what I was talking about. A few years ago, I was working with the kids. This was late 90s, and there was a young lady. There was a young lady who wanted to come and help me and Jen, and I, I want to be a mentor to the kids, and I want to come, and I, I want to I mentor the young ladies. And so, but I had no problem with that. She had already had a baby out of wedlock. No problem. I believe in forgiveness. I believe you learned something. You can help somebody with something. But, but I want to make sure you got victory over that before you try to encourage somebody else. See, victory means been there, done that, got keys, amen, took pictures and receipts. I've been this way before. I ain't going back. I know what you look like when you get there. I know what you're thinking before you say it because I know that's victory. Problem is most of us want to do victory in areas, uh, do, do ministry in areas we don't have victory over. I wish I had somebody that could say amen with me. We, 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 we got to have victory. But what happens is when you don't have victory and you go to help somebody else, you really ain't helping them for the good. That, that, that's what gets us in trouble when folk do stuff they ain't got no business doing. Amen. Listen, listen, I, I, I do not have a degree in psychology. I don't. I don't know anything about it. I know some folks who do. I know a little stuff uh, dealing in ministry, but I don't. I don't mm -mm. So when folk come to me, I can tell by the third visit whether or not they need me or they need somebody with letters behind their name. I wish I had a church that was going to be honest. 
I, I can tell by the third meeting because, see, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to fill you with courage. That's my job. I'm going to say it's going to be all right. I'm going to dust off your wounds. I'm going to bind them up and heal them up. I'm going to put you back on your horse, and I'm going to give you some Acts 2.38, and I'm going to give you some John 3.16, and I'm going to say you can do it, man. I'm rooting for you, cheering for you, and then you're going to get on off back on, on, the, on the road. But after about the third meeting, if you ain't listen to none of what I said, I don't have nothing else for you. And if you still arguing with me about stuff from our first meeting and now we on the third meeting and you ain't, you need to go talk to somebody <laughs> that can write on a little piece of paper, you can take it to a pharmacist <laughs> and get you some that'll help you get and stay right. <laughs> Amen, Walsh. There are also people need to go to one of them doctors that have a room that got pads on the walls <laughs> and a jacket that make you hug yourself. <laughs> you might need to go see one of them. Amen. So, well, Tyson, what's your point? When preachers start doing stuff that's outside of their pay grade, the church yeah. suffers for it. I got to know, I'm not Superman, I got to know, I ain't got nothing for you. You got to go talk to somebody can help you. I can't help you no more. I can walk you to a certain point. After that, you need somebody that know more than me. When we dabble in ministry in areas we don't know nothing about, we get in trouble. I just said that while I was here. That ain't the point of my sermon. The church that ceases to be hospitable to those in need has failed to see that Jesus' mission is accomplished when the least of these are ministered to. In the Old Testament, people believed that sickness and illness were attributed to one of four origins. All right. All right. I'm a patient up here look dead. Don't pay him no mind. He's sleep. Don't pay him no mind. He's sleep, okay? Uh, He's he a nice guy. Black guy, too. Uh, <laughs> You know, black men don't like to go to the doctor, you know. So, this morning I want to give you, I want to give you the four origins to sickness. The reason why I want to break the message up over the next two weeks, over two sermons and two, two points, is because next week I want to talk to you about what those diseases look like now. But I want to talk to you first about where they come from. Many of us want to trace the origin of our illness. And honestly, brothers and sisters, it all goes back to our first set of four parents, Adam and Eve. Brothers, you know the reason why you got to go to work every day on a job you can't stand? Thank you, Adam. Th thank you, Adam. Now, that's the reason why you got to get up early in the morning, work late into the evening. reason why you got to work double shift, swing shift, overtime, all that. Thanks, Adam. If Adam would have just did what he's supposed to do, lead his wife and keep his hands off the, amen, fruit, we, 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 we would be relaxing right now in the Lord. But the problem is he got beside himself, and because of sin, we are where we are. And you sisters, y'all didn't get off easy neither. Because you wanted to get off Eve in front of your husband, and do stuff you ain't had no business doing, you're going to always struggle and strive with your husband, seeing how you wanted to be the big boss anyway. Amen, Walls. All, all, the, all the brothers are saying, Tyson, say that, but I can't say amen. I'm not going to say amen, but I want you to stay here as long as you want to. And some husbands want me to just preach an hour right here on this point. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Because Eve wasn't, in the, wasn't doing what she was supposed to do, uh, God said, listen, you're going to always argue and struggle and strive with your husband. And then, and then not only that, you, you're going to want to have some babies. And uh, Lord have mercy. I'm going to make you remember you bringing babies into the world. So when them labor pains hit, just say, thank you, Eve. You can thank Eve for that. It, it ain't your husband problem. Jen looked at me like it was my fault. It wasn't my fault. That was Eve's fault. So, 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 so what we have... We try to trace our origin. If, 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 if you're like most folk, typically you have things that run in your family. Come on now. Listen, 
you can eat right, be skinny as a rail, and have high cholesterol. I could eat all wrong and be fat and out of shape, and my cholesterol just fine. You may just have it running. Come on, somebody, in your family. So I want to talk to you about the four origins. I don't know how far we're going to get, but I'm going to give them to you. The first one, the people of the Bible believe everything, everything flowed from God. The Hebrews were different by being strong monotheists, meaning they only believed in one God. And they attributed all phenomenon to the one true God who had revealed himself to them. God was responsible for everything, including disease. This same God could also give material blessings, health, and heal all diseases. To the Hebrews, God could give health or sickness, and in either case, he had his purpose or reason. Some stuff we deal with is just the walk God has for you. Now, I'm going to make it real plain right up and through here since we're flying over here. There are some people who are eunuchs meaning they have no desire for physical sexual relations. So for them to be unmarried is no problem. They're not burning with passion. They don't sit up late at night crying themselves to sleep, wishing they had somebody warm laying next to them. It ain't like that. They can handle themselves. They, they, they not hot and bothered. But then they're those... Lord have mercy, God. Y'all was saying amen a while ago. <laughs> Why y'all get quiet on me? Now y'all, I couldn't, I couldn't even finish my point. Two minutes ago, y'all was shouting. Then when I started calling the roll, it got quiet. <laughs> then there are those of us who can't hold our water, who head about to explode, who get all hot and just, just wiggle your toes. Now, say amen by wiggling your toes. <laughs> right, let me, let me see, let me see. Wiggle your toes. You ain't got to say amen out loud. There's some of us, we struggle. We wish we could control ourselves. We wish we could keep our rocket in our pocket. We wish we could keep our pocketbook closed. We, but we struggle. Now the question is, could not God have given those of us who can't control ourselves a little bit more qualities from Unix that we wouldn't be all hot and bothered? But well, Tyson, why is it I got to struggle with this? Because God is leading you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That's just the issue you're going to have to deal with. There's some things that bother us, that are sin to us, that we struggle with, that God has designed specifically for us. And you're just going to have to deal with it. But I will say this, if God brought you to it, you can best believe he can take you through it. So my, no matter how hard it might get, no matter how much of a struggle it may be, God not going to leave you by yourself. There's something, now, now listen, we all have our stuff. Now me, I, I'm not much of a smoker. Uh -uh. I mean, I smoke turkeys. Uh, <laughs> but I, never been appealing to me. Never. Never had that itch. Never wanted it. Amen. And I know some of us, we have graduated from the wacky tobacco to the wacky tobacco. I understand. We, we have our issue. They're quiet again. Y'all didn't quiet up on me again. I, I was saying amen a while ago. What happened, John? I don't know. That ain't my struggle. Now, the person who struggles with it wish they could trade places with me so they wouldn't have that internal itch. But God has designed that for you. Look, while I'm, uh, since, since you're quiet on me already, there are some people who struggle with their sexuality. Now, get quiet if you want. I'll bring my own amens right up in here. Now, I know who I is. I'm comfortable. I'm I, I, I'm a manly man, but I can wear pink. Amen. I, I I get my nails and my toes done. Have no problem with it. <laughs> Sit up. I, I want another woman to massage my feet and clip my toenails. I, that's all right by me. 
That's all right by me. My wife taught me that, and I, I, I believe in it. Amen. I, I, it, it, don't buy, it don't mean I'm less, I'm comfortable in my skin. Amen. But then there's some who are not. They're not comfortable. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't raised with the same things you may have been raised with. So they have questions. They have identity crisis. Then, Lord, don't let them watch TV in the days where you don't know who you are. Be 16 and confused. Now, just because that's their struggle don't mean that you got to stay in that. What that means is you got to trust God to bring you through that. So I want you to watch this. We can't throw folk out because we've determined that they sin is greater than anybody else's. I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask my dummy, amen, amen, brother. Because I want you to watch this. Everybody in this room got to self-sacrifice and deny themselves on something. Whatever your itch is, Christ can heal and soothe your itch. I'm going to show y'all what this looked like in the scripture. Psalm 103, love this scripture right here. Psalm 103 and verse number 1. Psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What is benefits, Psalmist? Who forgives all your iniquities. That's your sin. And who heals all your disease. Your issues that need tissues. God is here for that. And if you leave here just as sick as as you ever been that before you came in here, you haven't talked to the doctor yet. And you need to see him. The, the, second, the second one, origin, we're talking about origins of disease and sickness, is Satan. Satan and other evil spirits could also be responsible for disease. In the biblical scheme of things, Satan's ability to bring disease is in the permissive will of God. Remember that God is sovereign, meaning he either calls it to happen, he allow it to happen, or he knows that it happens. But it's all within his permissive will. So when people get sick and die, accidents, plane crashes, all the rest of those calamities, we, we are upset when they happen, but they're all within the will of God. Well, Satan uh, is allowed to wreak havoc at times. Y'all do know he's the prince of the darkness of the air, right? He's the prince of the air, and, 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 and he, he is going to wreak havoc on the earth. And I'm going to show you all what this looks like in Job here in just a second. The restriction on Satan's capacity for harm is clearly spelled out in the case of Job. I want you all to find Job chapter 1 real quick. The message of the New Testament is also clear in that despite cases of demon possession and of people acting under Satan's influence, Satan's time is finite, and his ultimate total defeat and destruction are certain. So just because Satan might be winning today don't mean he going to win it all. He just look like he ahead now. That don't mean he going to win. Remember now, Satan doesn't have the ability to be every place at every time. Only God has that. Satan don't have all power. Only God has that. So I'll be honest with you. When you in God, you ain't got no reason to be scared. You know why? Because the one you believe in is greater than the one who's wreaking havoc on you. Y'all remember the story now. God, God is, uh, has this man named Job living in the land of Uz. Y'all remember that? Job is blameless and upright. Job's a good guy. Uh, children, wife, possessions, all kind of stuff. And uh, the Bible says that the sons of God were going to and fro and Satan was walking with them. Remember, Satan is not infinite and he can't be everywhere at every time. So he comes and God says, hey man, what you doing? Uh, long story short, Satan says, well, I was walking around and, you know, I was noticing some things and, and I noticed something about this guy you got over here named Job and he loved to praise you and worship you, but you got a hedge around him. You keep protecting him from me. Why don't you let me take a crack at him and I bet you he curse you to your face. I said, oh really? He says, okay. You gonna talk bad about my servant Job? You can touch all he has, just don't touch him. So Satan went to work. He was permitted to mess with Job. So the first thing he did was, he hit us all in the gut. You know how he hits us in the gut? Touch your stuff. Come on, man, when somebody starts messing with your money, there's a problem. <laughs> Possessions, gone. Kids, gone. Houses, gone. Servants, gone. Mm. Satan comes back, chapter 2. Y'all remember that? 
I want to read the scripture to you out of chapter 1, verse number 12. Look at, look at what the Bible says. It says, but now stretch out your hand. This is Satan talking to God. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Look what the Lord said to Satan. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on his person. Now I want you to watch this. God had to give Satan permission to mess with Job. Now, if, if we could just put ourselves in the story, when you feel like you under demonic attack, if you want any solace in the situation, just know that God had to give permission to Satan to mess with you, which means God believed that you're going to stay faithful even underneath the demonic attack. I gave y'all reason to shout. Y'all didn't take me up on the offer. I said, even in the midst of the demonic attack, God is still in control. And he believes you're going to stay faithful even unto the end. Chapter 2 comes along. Satan basically says, all oh, skin for skin. Reason why he didn't curse to your face because you didn't let me touch him. Y'all remember that? So God gives him some more permission and says, okay, you can touch him, just don't kill him. So what does Satan do? He hit us where it really hurt. And he started messing with our health. Yep. Bible says boils. You know, he covered in sores head to toe. He got sick, so sick that his own wife said, baby, listen, why don't you just put yourself out your own misery? Curse God, let him strike you dead, and you can just get this thing over with. Now, I told y'all I'm not much of a psychiatrist, but I want y'all to watch this. That, to me, sounds like suicide. <laughs> That's just me. But don't it sound like she's saying, baby, just here, just end it. Put yourself out of misery. Just end it. Y'all see that? And do you know what Joe told her? Told her? He says, woman. I love that about Joe. He loped up on his wife. He's like, what? <laughs> he said, you speak like a foolish woman. What made her foolish? Well, Job told her, you can't accept the good things from God and not accept the bad stuff. Come on now. We want to praise God when we get the promotion. The moment you get your pink slip, oh, Lord, and why me? Am I right about it? You got to accept it all. Third, third, third thing, third thing, is sickness sometimes is inherited from your ancestors. You might find yourself sprawled out, and it had nothing to do with you. Now, this is where it's going to get real quiet, because brothers and sisters, we can pass illness and disease onto our children. Sickness can also come about because of the sins of one's ancestor. The most striking example of this is the death of David's son as a result of his sin with Bathsheba. I tell folk all the time, children don't ask to be born. And they have no control over what family they come into, what socioeconomic status the family has. They have no clue as to whether or not the father drinks or the mother's abusive. They're just born. But you best believe there's history before you get here. And after you become history, you're going to leave history for somebody else. The child that was born to David and Bathsheba did not live. And it was not his fault. It was because his daddy and mama didn't do right. The concept of origin of disease continued into the New Testament and was familiar to the disciples of Jesus. Y'all remember in John chapter 9? When they, when they walked up on the blind man and they asked Jesus, who sinned? This man and his parents that he was born blind. Somebody must have done something for God to make him be born blind. And Jesus says, no, no. See, he, he wasn't born blind because God was getting back at anybody. He wasn't born blind because his mom and daddy wasn't right. He was born blind that the works of God might be made manifest on him. 
So a preacher, what's that got to do with hospitality? When we see people who look scruffy and gruffy and rough around the edges, I want you to watch this. They may be that way as a testament to God. Because God take us all from here to over there. And you might just be catching that person on step one. But I pray I'm still alive to see them on step 100. I wish I had somebody was going to say amen. Look, look, look at what the Bible says in 2 Samuel. It says, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity. This is 2 Samuel 12 and verse number 11. I will raise up adversity from you and your house, and I will take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. This is, this is David's punishment. I, 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 I hate, I, I don't, I don't want to use the word, but I got to use the word. It's, it's what he get for having sinned against Bathsheba and sinned against God. And God says, okay, you're going to make a mockery and give everybody a cause to blaspheme my name? This is what you got to deal with. Adversity going to be in your house. Matter of fact, uh, you're going you're to have problems with future wives and your children from those wives. And everybody going to have hardship and headache because you could not control yourself, David. Look what the scripture says. And I'm going to embarrass you, God says. I'm going to have your neighbors see all of the stuff that's going on. I'm going to have your neighbors come up and even be a part of it. The Bible says, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before everybody. That's what the Lord said. There's some sins you can do, and don't nobody find out. So keep on living. Keep on living. Everything in the dark. So David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Meaning, David really should have died for his sin. God should have taken him, but God spared him. But you know who ended up dying for it? However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who was born to you shall surely die. And Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. I'm not going to get to my last point. I, I want to stop. Let's do an invitation this way. Y'all know what I'm deathly afraid of? I mean, this scares me to death. I know I come across like, uh-uh. You know what has me shaking in my boots? I don't want my children to inherit my bad habits. They already have. I'm deathly afraid that because of the decisions that I make, that my three kids are going to have to suffer for it. I am afraid that my sin will end up being their sin. I don't know about you, that bugs me to no end, especially when I struggle and I just can't help myself. Because it's in those moments I got to say, well, Hold on. This ain't about you. You got to do something for the sake of your children. I wish I had somebody tried to quit smoking before. Come on now. You, you make that vow because you don't want your kids and grandkids to suffer. Don't we? I'm going to get right because I don't want them to take up this bad habit. But you just can't help yourself. And you need somebody that's going to heal you and protect them. And only God can do that. I'm definitely afraid of passing my junk and leaving it for somebody else to deal with. Come on now, when, when, when Big Mama passed away and she left this big old house with all this stuff in it, that became somebody else's problem. And if you was one of the ones that had to clean up and figure out what we're going to do with all this, it might have took you months. You might have had to move in the house just to make heads and tails of it. Amen? My family's gone through that. And you try to figure out what we going to do with this. And it, ain't, it, it, and it don't really mean anything to you other than the fact that it belonged to Big Mama. So you, you love it because she loved it. But in your mind, it's all junk. Amen. Ain't no shame in it. Amen. Amen. 
But I had a great aunt, uh, great, great aunt, excuse me, two, two years ago, three years ago, she passed away. And her daughter was at a loss, did not live down here. They trying to get everything out of her apartment. And I, I guess because I helped them with the funeral, they just decided to dump it. <laughs> Couch, love seat, chair, end table, punch bowl, <laughs> dishes. But what got me was clothes. Now I don't know what they think. I'm old do with a 90-year-old woman's clothes and wardrobe, but they thought I should have it. At that moment, Brother Davis, you know what that stuff became to me? But I end up with it because of my relationship with the one before me. This is where I want to extend the invitation. Many of us are scared right now because we know we have influenced and encouraged that generation that came from behind us, and it ain't all good. And now they're sick because we're sick. And because we didn't get help, we have now passed it on to somebody else. Have you ever talked to your kid and they remind you of your rebellious self? God have a tendency to remind you where you've been and where you came from, don't it? And I realized I played a part in this as well. So I look to God for healing. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, the only one who can ease your pain and soothe your hurt is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. You come to him by faith, hearing and believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ that he hung, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary between two thieves. Got up from the grave, and that empty grave proves that our Savior lived. You come to him by faith. Being willing to repent of your sins. Confess that he's the Christ. Y'all know we've had 10 baptisms in 2015. Can't we have some more? Somebody in the room need to come on. And get with the doctor. Because I'm not the doctor. I might be dressed in scrubs, but I'm not the doctor. But I can introduce you to the one who's the great physician. If you hear you already a child of God, and maybe you caught up in the blame game, you know, it's your mama's fault, your daddy's fault, your sister's fault, your brother's fault, don't blame it on nobody. Give it to Jesus. Let him fix it for you. If you hear this morning and maybe you just in the middle of your struggle and you can't help yourself, ain't no time like the present. You don't have to give us the backstory and the history on your stuff. Just say, I need to be healed. And we're going to pray for you this morning. The guy is ready to take your responses. Do you need to come? We beg you to come right now. As together we stand. Oh, my trials. Oh, my care. Oh, my care. I can tell them I can tell to my Lord. To my Lord. And he my bed and bed. Yeah, my yeah, bed and bed. Through the pain. Through the pain. And the strength. The strength. Only Jesus Only bring me. Jesus bring me.
I take all my trials to God. All my trials to God. And gently lay them there. Jesus gives me strength. Jesus, he gives me strength through all my trials. All my trials. Burden load. Somebody need to come get the doctor's help. Full of care. And putting your head in the sand. Sorrows weighed my, my shoulders down. Satan is tricking you right now. Trying to get you to respond. And, down. and fill me and with despair. Me Sir, don't let him have his way. Let the spirit have his way this morning. Somebody need to but get God a knows. God knows. Oh, somebody needs some mercy. Mercy shows. Jesus lifts me up. Jesus 